Welcome to the Muzzle Blast podcast from the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association. Muzzle Blast is made possible by the membership of the NMLRA. Thank you. You can find out more at nmlra.org. I'm Eric Stanishek. I live down in uh, the Fort Worth, Texas area, and uh, really my my start with hunting, of course, uh, you know, like many of us, my dad brought me into the hunting world back when I was uh, barely a teenager. And he uh, he used to guide, my dad and uncle used to guide out in Wyoming, so I'd tag along and kind of hang out in camp before I could actually get a get a permit and hunt myself. But but back then it was, you know, I got in with uh, with the rifle, you know, with the 270 and, and did that hunting for a while. Uh, what really changed my direction over time into muzzleloader is uh, just uh, probably my experience in Alaska, a couple of hunts that I had in the early 2000s, late 90s. Uh, I was on a doll sheep hunt, two back-to-back years, and, and one year I took a doll sheep with a rifle at 351 yards running away from me. The other year wow. I took one bedded at 413 yards, and that was that was with a rifle. And I, it, even though I was, I was satisfied with the hunt and, and excited about that, you know, the, the high power rifle to me was more of, more of just shooting an animal. Even the animal didn't know I was there. I wasn't getting any time with them. It was almost see and shoot. And so uh, I, I moved a little bit more to wanting to challenge myself. And, and in 2001, I switched over to uh, hunting almost exclusively with muzzleloaders. I bought my first gun was a just a kit gun I bought from Cabela's and I built the 54 caliber Hawk in and okay, yeah. got the barrel blued and stained the stock and, you know, had the little brass fixtures on it. And, you know, it was, it was just a fun project that I wanted to take out and I hunted with it. I took a white tail that year in Nebraska and, uh, you know, nothing, nothing big, but it tasted good. And, and it was from that day on, I, I will tell you, it's, the romance of the smoke and the one shot challenge that has brought me back to the muzzle loader every year. And, and I've got a gun safe full of high power rifles and I haven't touched any of them for, uh, for at least 15 years now. So wow. it's, uh, it, it just, it really, it hooked me. And, and then the challenge became how close can I get, uh, to big game with a muzzle loader? You know, how much time can I spend with an animal? And I've, I've talked to a lot of people about that concept is, you know, time with the animal, if we're hunting them, you know, giving them all the respect that we, that we should, uh, the animals that we pursue, you got to spend time with the animal, learn the individual animal, you know, try to, try to win in his, uh, you know, in his environment. And, yeah. uh, and the muzzleloader really brought me to that. So, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some of my, my favorite hunts with the muzzleloader, I mean, other than the, the pronghorn that we'll talk about here today are, um, you know, I took a mountain lion with a, uh, with my 50 caliber Hawken, a different gun that I bought, uh, took him at a foot and a half underneath the juniper tree in, uh, in Nevada. And wow. I mean, the smoke was the only thing between him and I, 190 pound mountain lion. And that, uh, that was a little bit of adrenaline there, but, yeah. uh, you know, other, other hunts that have just been, you know, really right next to the animal. I took a, a Quebec Labrador caribou at 12 yards bedded i'd spotted him from a mile and a half away and and crawled right in and once again the the only thing between he and i was the smoke once the trigger was pulled and it's just it's moments like that where you can where you force yourself as a as a hunter and outdoorsman just to get close and and know you've got one chance uh because you know i I can reload quick but uh you know if you if you miss they're gone and you know here we are fumbling powder and stuffing a a bullet down the muzzle and you know, putting a new primer on. So, um, but there's, there's been a lot of, a lot of fun experiences like that over the years. I've, uh, since I switched, you know, in 2001 was really the year that I, I decided muzzle loader was what it was going to be. And, and, uh, you know, really hung the right, the uh, high power rifles up at that time. But I've, I've taken 66 big game animals since then, uh, with the muzzle loader. And wow. it's, I, I almost feel uncomfortable with a high power rifle, you know, with a 270 or 300 wind mag or anything. It's just, it's almost foreign to me, but I, <laughs> you know, any of my muzzle loaders, I, I pick up any of my 50 calibers or that 50, 54 caliber Hawken and it's, it just becomes a part of my body and, you know, kind of, it kind of throws us back, uh, back in time a little bit, especially with the octagon barrel guns that I, that I have. So that's, uh, that's, that's really the start of it is, uh, 
you know, what got me hooked. And it's, it's a passion that I pass down to the kids right now. I've got, uh, I've got four kids and, and three of them hunt. And, uh, my daughter at nine years old took her first deer with the muzzleloader, uh, with my 50 caliber in line. And, uh, last year I had, uh, had my oldest stepson. He, he took his first buck with the muzzleloader and, and, uh, I've got my youngest one out this year, so we're looking to looking to finish that. And then my my wife, who was not really a hunter until two years ago, I I put my Thompson Center Omega in her hand, and she thought the gun was pretty, and I figured <laughs> that was enough to <laughs> to get her out in the field, and and she ended up taking a really nice buck with it. And the smoke caught her too. She thought, you know, this is this is actually really neat. She she just kept talking about the uh, the white cloud that was floating towards the animal while the buck laid down there. So yeah, it. I, I think that's something we all have in common, that little thread of, uh, you know, w- what really hooks us with the muzzleloader. And, you know, on top of that, it's the challenge, but there's so much, uh, you know, it's it's a visual difference as well, uh, for sure. Yeah, it's so much different. And I, that's what we talk about a lot amongst ourselves in the association, but then with the other people that we talk to, just the whole process is so different compared to modern shooting. Even if, if you're at a range or if you're out hunting, there's a... Um, I like to refer to it as kind of like a rhythm or a dance that you go through as you're loading and, and, and waiting. My, my background in muzzleloading is just on the competitive shooting side. So just, just punch and paper and you mm-hmm. get you a rhythm when you're doing that. And I've not hunted much, but I can imagine it might be the same in that respect. Cause like you said, you only have one shot and by that, t- by the time that's over, your, your odds of getting another shot off are just slim to none. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, I mean, you, you know how it is, you practice the best you can on, uh, on being proficient on reloading, but even, you, you know, I feel I'm, I'm pretty quick at it, but I'm, I'm still 20 seconds if I've got everything right there in my pocket, ready to go. And, you know, and it's, uh, but you're right, that rhythm, it's, it's kind of second nature. You shoot and then it's powder and it's primer, you're stuffing the barrel and then final step, putting the primer on and, and you're ready to go, but it's, uh, it, it's fun. It's fun. I'll, uh, you know, with the guns, the, in the hunting into things, and I imagine this is, this is very much the same punch and paper. You've got to know, um, you know, the, the curious thing about muzzle loaders is it could even be the same manufacturer, same gun, three of them in a row, and they all shoot different. They all like different powder. They yep. like different charges. They like different bullets. And, you know, so I've probably put, you know, a couple thousand rounds down range in my, my hunting muzzle loaders just to really learn the gun and learn what it likes. And, and, uh, in the, the, uh, Thompson center Omega. So my inline, uh, that I used, uh, for the pronghorn hunt, it's, it's a gun that anything less than 150 grains, uh, I, I get some in- inaccuracies in there, but, uh, with 150 grains of powder, it's, uh, it, it is super accurate. I mean, it, it, kicks like a mule but oh yeah you know, <laughs> With that much yeah as you'd imagine and i you know i, I don't know exactly I, I hadn't calculated exactly how much burns in the barrel but i would guess you know up upwards of 100 and you know 125 130 grains of that burns within the barrel and that's probably where i'm getting the consistency because it's the same amount of burn that happens throughout that barrel every single time there's a little extra powder that burns outside the barrel that doesn't do anything for uh, for the bullet or the the velocity or anything but I think it's that consistency, but I've got other guns that, man, I can't go over 110 grains of powder in them or else, you know, they start spitting the bullet any, any which direction. So it's really Really? about learning, learning that gun too. And you know, what the, what the gun likes, what powder, what bullet, what combination. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of muzzle loading. It's so great. And at least once you get into it is I think from the outside, it can look really complicated. Um, but if you're the kind of person that likes, it's almost like a little puzzle, you know, depending on which gun you're using and trying to find that out. I mean, you just get to shoot more. <laughs> and when, then once you find it, you know, you're kind of in the zone and you're ready to go do something. But I think finding that sweet spot is part of the fun. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it, it builds that relationship. But I, you know, a couple of times I've said it's, it is a relationship with the gun because, you know, I'm, I'm relying on the gun to do what I need it to do in, in all kinds of odd weather and scenarios and situations. And, you know, I, I, you got to have that relationship. You got to trust the gun. You got to know what it's going to do. You got to be able to predict, you know, where, where it's going to shoot in a hunting situation. Sometimes all you have is a split second. And, uh, 
you know, without a, a good relationship with, uh, with your weapon and with your components, you, uh, you just not going to have the confidence it takes. Yeah, definitely. Huh, that's really neat. But, uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, the, the, the exciting hunt this year, I'll tell you a little bit about it. It, yeah. uh, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. I've got a friend in, in New Mexico. His name's Aaron Bauer. Aaron works at Wilderness Outfitter Productions. And, uh, I've hunted with him before. We hunted Oryx, uh, you know, off range Oryx, free range Oryx. And, uh, that was, that was a tremendous hunt. Uh, and that was the first time I'd hunted with him and he had never taken a muzzleloader hunter out. So he was a little, you know, a little, little hesitant on the hunt. I, I guess a little concerned, you know, just to see how, uh, how it would work on a big animal like that. And, and after that hunt, he was, he was more than impressed with how the gun works. And, and, uh, we just developed a really fast friendship at that point. So fast forward a couple of years, uh, he knows pronghorn are, are one of my favorite big game animals to hunt. And, and New Mexico has a really healthy population of them and, uh, opportunities abound throughout the state. So he, uh, was scouting some ranches and, and found a few ranches that, uh, that he had, uh, could get outfitter permissions to hunt and, and contacted me over the, the summer. And he said, Hey, I've got, got some good spots, some good ranches. There's some good bucks out there. I think they're, they're, uh, bucks that you would like to hunt and, and hopefully get a chance to shoot. And there's some pretty big ones out there, you know, so I, I booked the hunt. I called my buddy, Kevin Orton in Utah. Uh, he and I, we, uh, we've worked together 20 some years in different industries and different businesses. And, and, uh, he just had uh, on the custom end, he had a guy design a 45 caliber muzzleloader for him and, and custom build it. And, you know, it's kind of, it's a more long range, mm -hmm. uh, in line, but he, he wanted to go along on the hunt as well. And there was two spots that we booked it. And, you know, for us, it's a good chance to get out and, you know, it's the camaraderie of the hunt. And I like, you know, hunting with anybody, but, uh, but another person who's, uh, who's shooting, you know, powder and bullets and out of a muzzleloader that, uh, that keeps it all pretty, pretty even competition uh, right. <laughs> when it comes to shooting. So, so we booked it and, and headed out. Our season was, uh, end of August and met up with, with Aaron in, uh, in Eastern uh, New Mexico and, uh, you know, grabbed some dinner that first night, just told stories and, you know, the typical hunt and camp, uh, you know, kick around stories, maybe exaggerate a few things talk <laughs> about, uh, past hunts and, you know, just have a good old time, uh, you know, with the brotherhood of other hunters and the next morning, the, uh, the hunt was on. So Aaron had, had told us, he said, I think one of the better bucks on the property is hanging out. Uh, you know, as soon as we get into the property and shut the gate and start going through, uh, some of the two track dirt roads, he says, one of the better bucks hangs around up there. So if we see him, we probably want to be ready to go right away, you know, ready to shoot or ready to take a shot. And, and, uh, that's, that's not exactly my style. Uh, I, I like to, I like to hunt to take some time if needed. And, and I'm not much of a, of a jump shooter. You know, I can, I can make a quick shot if I need to, I've done it plenty of times before, but I'm, I'm one of those, like I said earlier, I like to spend time with the animal. I like to learn a little bit, like to watch, like to feel like I'm right there on his terms, you know, while I'm hunting him. And, right. uh, but and it's, it's a, uh, in a way almost fair, <laughs> you could say. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and the, the, uh, principles of fair chase are, yeah. are, uh, are, are big, you know, there's, there's tons of advantages in this world and, you know, not, you know, I'll support any type of hunter, no matter what weapon they hunt with, as long as it's ethical and it's legal. And, you know, it's just not for me to, to shoot the thousand yard shots with high power, but I know that's, that's kind of the technological world we're coming to, to where some of the weapons, you know, really don't give the animals that much of a chance. So, yeah, you know, for me, it's, it's a different game, but yeah, we, we, uh, rolled onto the property that morning and, and sure enough, I just, I happened to look out the side window of the truck and I said, Oh, there's a buck with a couple of those. And, and, uh, Aaron, so Aaron had kind of an interesting, uh, nickname for this buck. He, uh, he titled him El Mucho Ding Dong. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, you know, come from, uh, I think that's Bad Santa is the, is the movie that <laughs> that reference comes from, but he says it's, it's the biggest antelope he'd ever seen. And, and so we saw him out there with a couple of does and Aaron said, you better get out of the truck, get behind that cedar tree. And, you know, I bailed out and I'm fumbling for my, uh, my primer to put on the gun and, you know, I get set up and it just, you know, it just didn't feel like the right shot. It was in within my wheelhouse. It was under 200 yards and he was, he was just kind of quartering. We had some wind and, 
And it's, uh, you know, I'm not willing to take that chance of either, you know, completely missing and blowing him out of there or taking a bad shot is the last thing I want to do and and wounded animal. So, you know, I, I watched him run off with the does and, you know, we, uh, we pursued him there. We followed up, we'd go from one tree to the next tree to the next tree. And he had tipped over the top of this, uh, this little rise and was down in the next Valley. And we were able to get on him one more time that morning. But, uh, you know, once again, it just, it wasn't the perfect shot. He was facing me. So I had a really small window, <laughs> uh, to, to take the shot through and he was fully aware of where we were and the does got spooked and he turned and ran, uh, you know, and I just, uh, I just couldn't commit to the shot there, which is, which is fine. You know, we've got a three day yeah. season and this is morning time. And so we regrouped, we hiked a mile back to the truck and, and, uh, we tried to figure out, you know, looking around, where would they go? You know, what direction would they spin around? And so we headed up over the next hill and, and got parked and started glassing. And sure enough, he was about a quarter mile down below us chasing the does and uh, it was it is just right in the beginning of the rut. So the bucks are are starting to round up the does. The does really aren't coming into heat yet, but uh, the bucks are getting a little anxious. So he had two does, one that wanted nothing to do with him, and the other doe was kind of tolerating him. And he'd keep chasing one. Uh, <laughs> the other doe would go the other direction. So, you know, it's just we were watching a, a circus for about 30 or 40 minutes, just waiting for his next move. Because where they were, there was no way we were cutting the distance to him. At that point, they were in a perfect spot to, uh, you know, to stay uh, stay protected. So we just watched him for a while and until uh, uh, one doe, she ended up making a run for it. And that's the one he was most interested in. So he full on chased her. And <laughs> this is about a half mile, you know, just running pronghorn are, are amazing animals. They can go from zero to 60 miles an hour in about a second. And, uh, you know, they cover ground. Their eyes are equivalent to, uh, some guys say eight power. Sometimes some guys say nine power binoculars, but, uh, they hmm. can, they can see real well and they live in country to where they could, they can see you coming. So that's why it's, you know, pronghorn have always been one of my favorite animals. It's a, it's a big game of chess. They're going to see you. You're going to see them. Most of the time it ends up in checkmate and they win, but on occasion <laughs> you get a little bit, little bit lucky and uh, you know, you happen to move the pieces the right way, but he chased this doe and the other doe, Uh, took off back towards where we saw him to begin with. So now the does were split up. And fortunately for us, that meant two sets of eyes instead of three. And, uh, you know, so we, we made our, our approach. We got a little closer and we were kind of like badgers crawling over the hill, (laughs) just could see our heads and they were down below us. They, they happened to be down in a a cactus flat, a lot of choyas and, and uh, some cedar trees down in there. So there was some cover at this point uh, that we could, utilize and and we got into uh where we could see the one doe down standing in the cactuses and and she kind of knew something was up on the hill she didn't really see us but she probably had picked up some movement up there so we just sat down and watched and you know we're sitting 170 yards away and she's clear if if she was my target i could have taken the shot there no problem the wind had died down uh, a little bit in that little bowl but we just couldn't find the buck and, and we knew he was around there. He's not leaving that doe. And yeah. so we're just scanning the whole area. And I, I'll never forget when I finally figured out where he was, he's standing behind this thick wall of Choya cactus. And all I can see is about the top 10 inches of his horns. <laughs> and he's staring right at us through the cactus. I can't see his eyes or his nose, but he can see us. Yeah. He's you know, got he's got a bead on you. Oh yeah. He's, he's absolutely got us. And so, you know, when I saw that and he's just, he's not moving, he's a statue. He's just standing there and I thought, okay, there's zero shot for me. He knows we're here. The doe knows we're here. The gig's going to be up pretty soon. It's just a matter of let's sit and wait and see what they do next. And, and sure enough, the doe got nervous enough. She took off. They went underneath another barbed wire fence on the ranch and, and went into a different pasture so once again, pack our stuff up, hike yeah. back to the truck and, <laughs> and, uh, regroup. And we decided we were going to, you know, curve around, kind of do a big loop on them and see what else was on the property. Cause you know, Kevin had a tag too. And, and, uh, these how, are only three antelope we'd seen so far. How big was the property that you're working at? 
uh, the property, up, I want to say it was about 6,000 acres wow. uh, that we're hunting. So it, it's a pretty good sized ranch. You know, it has a lot of, I think he has about eight different uh, pastures fenced off within there for his cows. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a working cattle ranch and, and uh, the antelope are just kind of, kind of that uh, secondary thing that happens to come in and out of the ranch. But so, so when they were slipping under fences and going to different pastures, they were still well within our, our property in New okay. Mexico. When you, when you get a tag, it's a tag for a, a unit, but you have to have a signed landowner permission slip and then you can only hunt on that land. So, okay. If, if there was, you know, different properties in that, if we had different permission slips, we could have hunted elsewhere, but we just had, had the one and that, uh, little did we know it, we thought, well, the property's big enough, you know, they should stick around. If we bump them from one place, we can just catch up to them in another place. Well, that, that was, you know, it sounded good until, uh, until it wasn't, <laughs> um, you know, as they kept running and kept moving away. Uh, so we regrouped and we went around. Uh, this one last hill and, and parked up there. So we're about a quarter mile or so from the property line that goes on to the next ranch. And, and of course that one's, you know, that one's off limits, but we pulled over there and there's another really good buck down below us. And my buddy, Kevin from Utah, he said, Oh my gosh, that's a good looking buck. I would love to, love to hunt that guy. I'd love to shoot him. And we were just starting to make plans for Kevin to, to make a stock down towards this buck. Cause he's about 400 yards away. So he need to uh, cut the distance a little bit and uh, the buck seemed to be all alone, but he was staring off to our left and we couldn't see anything to our left. Um, but as Kevin was getting around and, and thinking about going after that buck from the left, you know, it's almost like interstage left. Here comes <laughs> the big buck and the doe that we'd been on all morning. And they came over to this other buck and there was uh, some of the most unique posturing for pronghorn that we had seen it's uh, you know they puffed up and they were strutting you know showing their dominance or trying mm -hmm. to establish dominance and in the middle of all of this the doe wanted nothing of it she took off and ducked under that last barbed wire fence and went about a half mile onto the other property and once <laughs> the bucks got done staring at each other they realized she took off and they followed her and <sighs> talk about heart sinking down in my chest i i just realizing, okay, they're, they're on another ranch. I don't know if anybody's over there hunting. I don't, you know, you, you don't know, but they're one thing we did know is we no longer could pursue them. We just had to yeah. sit there and, uh, and we sat there and we watched and, and it was quite the show. We, we watched a fight between the two bucks and, and at first now the other buck, he wasn't quite as large as the one I ended up killing, but he was the more aggressive one. You know, it goes back to it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size mm -hmm. of the fight in the dog. And and this younger buck, smaller buck, uh, he was <laughs> he was full of piss and vinegar. And he, he would charge after the big buck. The big buck would just turn around and not make eye contact, just kind of stay, keep a couple of strides ahead of him and just keep, you know, looking the other direction until he just got irritated enough. The, you know, the young one had pushed him far enough. Uh, the, the buck I ended up killing, he stopped and turned and started walking right back towards the other buck. And, you know, pronghorn fights, I, I know you mentioned that you don't, you don't do much on the hunting side, but, uh, I'll tell you pronghorn antelope, they are vicious when the bucks fight. They, uh, oh, I, bet. I, I mean, they just go at it. There's tufts of hair flying. You can see dirt and dust. And finally what happened is the younger buck got, uh, one of his horns hooked underneath the jaw of the big buck and lifted his front feet off the ground, pushed him backwards into a whole bunch of cactuses and rolled him over and, and skewered him in the side. Oh, geez. And yeah, it, uh, it, it was something to watch. I mean, it, it was, you know, mother nature at its finest right there. Yeah. But you know, the whole survival of the, of the fittest and the strongest get to breed and pass on their genetics. So, you know, this, this buck, he kind of licks his wounds a little bit and he goes and, and lays down in some cedar trees and he's still on the other property and we're all you know just uh, a little bit surprised on what we saw and, you know just trying to trying to think ahead what what may happen next and just then as i'm watching this where this buck disappeared he comes out of those cedars and the one thing that i know about about pronghorn after hunting them for 25 years is that they they are very territorial they do mm -hmm. have their comfort zone 
you know, they have their place that they know so well, they know every tree, every rock, everything about it. And if they're, you know, if they get too far away from that, and of course, something like this, they get in a fight, he's going to come right back to where he knows he's in control and where he has his core territory. So, uh, you know, as he pokes his head out of those cedars and starts coming back towards the fence line, back onto our property, the three of us ran. I said, we need to get over to that cedar tree and cut him off. I know exactly what's going on. He's going to come right back to where we saw him this morning. And sure enough, that was the case. He came over as soon as he ducked underneath the barbed wire fence. He started trotting up the hill through the cedars. And we had to run, I mean, a full-on sprint to get to another cedar to cut down that distance. I wanted to be within 150 yards just to, you know, be real comfortable with the shot. The wind had picked up again. It was blowing about 30 miles an hour. And uh, we got in, and, and there was a couple shot opportunities, but they were so fleeting that, uh, you know, right when I got the gun on him, he'd disappear behind some more cactuses, and then he'd come out the other side running, and then he'd stop behind a tree, and it, uh, it truly ended up being a team effort. Uh, my buddy Kevin, who was right behind me in the ear, he's, he's running the video camera a little bit at this time. He says, there's one more spot, and then he's going to disappear. And so he got me pointed over on the spot. He said, he's going to come right through there. And I turned and got set up and in, in my mind real quick, gauging the wind, I had a, a stiff wind from my left to my right. The buck was moving from left to right. And there was a hole in the cactus uh, about the size of my head. And I knew that's where he was going to come through. So, you know, I, I uh, had the sights aimed just to the left side. So I'm actually, crosshairs are in the cactus. But I know the bullet's going to drift into that hole. And as soon as his nose came through that hole at a trot, I squeezed it off and, you know, big old puff of white smoke. But we heard the, the unmistakable sound, just that whack. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, once the smoke cleared, there's no antelope on that hillside. And we knew that he was down. Still at this point, we had no idea what we were walking up to. We knew it was Big Buck. Right. I knew it was the biggest one I've, I'd ever seen in, in the wild. I've taken some big ones before, but I knew it's the biggest one I'd ever seen. And we start walking up there. We get about 20 yards away. We can see the white from his belly. We get a little bit closer, and we walked up to him, and everybody was just completely silent. I mean, you could have heard a pin drop. We were all quite amazed. Just, I mean, 18-inch long horns, which uh, – I. I've taken one antelope previous to this that had 16 inch long horns, which is a really big antelope. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, at 18 inches was, uh, you know, just really blew our minds. But, uh, we, we, uh, we took a lot of time there, you know, kind of gave thanks and, and praise and enjoyed the animal and enjoyed the time and lots of high fives and hugs and back pats and, uh, <laughs> you know, all the celebration that goes with it. But, uh, you know, we, I, I put a, a rough tape on it. I'm actually a, a, a official measure for Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young, and Long Hunter Society. And so, you know, I, I knew the numbers. I knew the measurements. I knew yeah. what I was looking at. And, uh, and as we did the rough score there in the field and, and uh, you know, of course, green score, antelope shrink more than any other animal in that 60-day oh, really? drying period. Yeah. Their, uh, their horns, there's a, a membrane up underneath them, so you're going to lose a little bit of circumference, use a, lose a little bit of length generally in that first 60 days. So uh, I, I knew he'd shrink down, but he was almost 94 inches just green in the field that day. And, uh, and I called my dad in Wyoming because he's, you know, my biggest hunting influence, and, and we both love chasing pronghorn with the, the muzzleloader. <laughs> and I, I told him some of the numbers, and he said, are Wait a second. Are you serious? 18 inch longhorns? I said, yeah. He said, seven and a half inch bases? I said, yeah. <laughs> and, and I told him the numbers and he said, you realize the current world record in long hunter is 90 and four eights and it's a two way tie. <laughs> and I said, yeah. I, <laughs> this one could do it. I know that. Yeah. I said, this one, we'll see what drying, you know, what the drying period does. And I said, but I, I'm pretty sure this one, this one's going to hold above that. And, uh, man, I'll tell you what, Ethan, that, that was the longest 60 day drying period I've ever lived through. I can imagine <laughs> just, just waiting to see where he would come down to. And, and, uh, you know, he ends up at the, the final net score of 91 and six eighths. So, uh, inch and a quarter above, uh, the previous number one for long hunter. And, you know, not, not that that's the most important part of the hunt, but it is a good little exclamation point at the end of the sentence. 
yeah. uh, you know, to, to have that. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's great to, for the animal to get the recognition he deserves, you know, being that big a buck and that mature, I got him, uh, uh got him aged. I did the, uh, uh, okay. sent the teeth in for that, uh, cementum annual eye, uh, uh, aging. So they cut the, the lower front two teeth, uh, they put dye in them and then they dissect them and they count the rings very similar to a tree. Right. And so this buck was five and a half years old, which, uh, is for a pronghorn. That's, that's a good old mature buck. And that's, that's what I always try to target is that mature animal that's, that's lived his life and, yeah, you know, has, has been around. So there's no sense in taking a button buck. Right. You right. Know, just, yeah. Just in general. Yep. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's but, just awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really <laughs> neat to hear the story. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. It's uh, you know, it was fun. It's one of those, it's the uh, third time was the charm. Well, third, I guess fourth time was the charm three stocks on him and, and didn't get the shot, but then finally, finally took a shot and, and the shot that I had, it was 91 yards. So well within my wheelhouse. I mean, it's uh, you know, I punch paper at a hundred yards all the time with all my guns just to make sure they're, they're dialed in. And, you know, I can, I can make shots farther than that, but it goes back once again to it, it's, it's time with the animal. It's the experience. It's, it's the hunt. You yeah. know, it's not just shooting with muzzle loading. It is absolutely the hunt, and uh, you know it, it, the challenge. Some guys say, "Well, you know, with an inline muzzle loader, well, that's the same as shooting a high power rifle." No, it's not. I mean, you you still have one chance. You got one shot. You got yeah. a whole lot of other things that'll affect you. That bullet drift, even at ninety one yards, the bullet drift with the powder and bullet setup that I have, you know, that'll still push the bullet about five inches at ninety one yards with a thirty mile an hour crosswind. So high power rifle you don't have that drift you don't you don't have the challenges that we do as muzzleloader hunters so. yeah and that's what makes it great and that's what makes it you know just like you said it's, the size of the buck is not necessarily what it's all about but it's a great exclamation mark for it mm-hmm. you know, yeah and, absolutely and that you took it with a muzzleloader too is just awesome mm-hmm yeah, that uh, I wouldn't wouldn't have it any other way. <laughs> That's awesome. That's what we like to hear. We uh, we talked to a couple guys that did a um, a dugout canoe expedition of the Wabash, and and they I mean they were real traditional guys, flintlock um, hunters, and dressed all in period garb and took period food and things. But the same um, kind of themes pop up whether I'm talking to you or I'm talking to them or if I'm talking to somebody on the firing line. You know, it's the, it's the challenge of the muzzleloader. It's the intricacies of it. It's, it's the time spent with your rifle, the time spent doing with what, whatever you're doing with it. If you're just trekking into the woods and camping or if you're hunting, you know, it's that time spent. And the, it's, it's a different time spent, I think, with a muzzleloader than it would be uh, with, like you say, with a high-powered rifle. It's almost as if the, um, the slowness of the muzzleloader, so to speak, slows you down too and, and allows you to enjoy things differently oh i I'd, I'd agree with you a hundred percent there it's uh you know in in today's world where everything's about how fast can it get done and you know lightning speed and technology and all that it's it's good to have that slow down you know and it, it teaches you to appreciate things you see so many more intricate details in for me as a hunter so many more intricate details about nature and what's going on. And, and you learn, you know, these things that you learn about the animal's habits of, of just having to spend that time and actually calculate and think about things and make it all come together, uh, you know, more so than, the, than many of the, the modern advantages we have these days. I mean, you're a big game hunter that I can tell. <laughs> um, how long have you been working with or working on entering in the Long Hunter Society? Well, I've, uh, my first animal that I entered, I, I want to say that was 2002 or 2003. So I actually do have, uh, 42 animals in the long hunter book right now. Wow. Uh, and, uh, and a large chunk of those are pronghorn antelope, but, uh, this is, uh, this is my first number one I had for a while. Actually in 2003, I took a, a grizzly bear, uh, with the muzzleloader in Alaska that was wow. in the number two spot up until this last records book. I think it, I think it fell to number six or so right now, but, uh, it was, it was number two for a while. Number two, when I first shot it and, uh, 
you know, my dad's, he, he's always got some type of little quip or joke or, or quick witted uh, comment. And he says, well, it's only number two because there's not that many dumb people that'll shoot a grizzly bear with a muzzleloader. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you, when you said that, I'll admit, I was thinking, whoa, <laughs> this is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, it, uh, it, it was, uh, that, that was yet another story. I mean, that was, that was another fun hunt, but that bear was actually coming right at us. I ended up taking him at 90 feet. So wow. it, uh, it was, it was touch and go. I mean, now you talk about trusting your weapon and trusting your, uh, your components at that point, you, uh, you truly only have one chance. And if that chance goes bad, you may never have a chance again in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a pronghorn is one thing, but a grizzly bear will hunt you back. Oh yeah. Oh Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, if you, you quickly realize that you're not the top of the food chain, once you pull that trigger, if that shot doesn't, doesn't hit exactly where you need it to. Wow. You're uh, a braver man than I. <laughs> <laughs> well, brave or crazy or a combination well, yeah. of the two, you know, that, that's yeah. yet to be determined. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you oh. so much, Eric. I don't want to keep you too long, but this was, this was wonderful. It was really neat to hear the story. I've been talking with, with Rick Weber, who is running the Long Hunter program now, about it a little bit, but I didn't want him to give me too many details. I wanted to kind of hear it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and you did not disappoint. This was really, really neat. Uh, well, great. Well, I appreciate uh, being able to share it, and, you know, uh, obviously I, I love everything that uh, uh, National Muzzle Muzzleloading Rifle Association does, and uh, I love the Long Hunter Society and, you know, truly what it stands for and keeping the records of, uh, of the great animals and those of us who take on that, uh, that great challenge of muzzleloader hunting for big game. Yeah. So just to kind of slowly wrap things up here, is there anything, um, uh, that you'd like to plug? You mentioned your buddy had a video camera, you know, are you posting this stuff online anywhere? Is that a part of your, of a business, so to speak? This is just kind of a chance for you to just talk about what you're doing a little bit and we can direct some people your way. Yeah, well, I, you know, the, the videoing is, is mostly just personal, you know, personal consumption there. It's uh, and the memories that, of course, are indelible in our minds, but sometimes uh, as we age, it's good to have it on, on videotape. So Definitely. I've got a lot of my hunts on videotape. I, you know, not many people have, have seen them, but uh, occasionally I'll, I'll post one online on my social media accounts. But, uh, you know, that's, that's mostly personal use. But, you know, I guess the, the biggest plugs uh, for me are, are just the friendship and the, and the uh, brotherhood that I had with, uh, with the guys on the hunt, Aaron Bauer, who's uh, arguably one of the top guides in New Mexico, at least in my eyes, one of the best that there is out there, and also just a great friend as well, and then, uh, then my buddy Kevin Orton in Utah. So, uh, you know, great to, great to be with them. The outfitter that Eric booked this hunt with was Wilderness Outfitter Productions. You know, they do a great job with clients. They hunt all big game animals across New Mexico, and, and Aaron's, uh, Aaron's one of their top guides that, that does all that. But, you know, really for me, it's uh, you know, a little bit of a throwback here, and you know the powders and everything else, but I, I still shoot. I'm, I'm one of the holdouts. I shoot the American Pioneer powder, which is not around anymore. But uh, <laughs> when, when they were going under i hit a couple different cabelas and i bought all the powder i could and i've been storing it in my gun safe with a lot of silica gel so it stays dry and you know one of these years i'm going to run out of that and have to find a new powder that uh, this gun loves just as much as the american pioneer <laughs> <laughs> so. well, that's great it's a little icing on the cake then for the uniqueness of of your muzzleloader oh yeah yep absolutely Oh. That's great. And you said that was a, there was a Thompson Center Omega, you said. Yeah, yeah, Thompson Center Omega. So uh, it, uh, it was the second inline that I ever bought. I, I shot the Hawkins first, and then I got a Thompson Center Black Diamond and, and did some hunting with that, open sights. And then uh, and I stepped up to the, the inline, you know, with a scope world. And, you know, for me, I, I, I hunt all the guns the same, you know, whether it's an octagon barrel or a scope gun, I, I try to get within range out of the like I said earlier, 66 big game animals I've killed with a muzzleloader. My average shot is 96 yards. So it's, I, I play that 100 yard or less window as often as possible. But Thompson Center Omega uh, bullet, and then I shoot or our Thompson Center Omega gun, and I shoot the Thompson Center uh, shockwave bullets. Uh, they're 250 grain bullet. 
and I've taken everything from, you know, on the small end, coos deer in Mexico with that bullet and gun and powder combination uh, up to uh, I've taken two bison that make the, uh, the Long Hunter Society record book. And, and both of those, uh, well, let's take that back. One of those was with that same bullet set up. The other one was a 54 caliber uh, with a 444 grain uh, buffalo bullet. But, uh, you know, really I found the combinations will take any animal in, in North America. That 250 grain bullet coming out of that Omega is, uh, is a deadly combination with plenty of knockdown power. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you again, Eric, so much for sharing all this stuff. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Well, I appreciate our time today, Ethan. If you liked this episode and want to hear more, be sure to subscribe to the Muzzle Blast podcast wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on social media. You can find us under at Muzzle Blasts. Muzzle Blast is made possible by the membership of the NMLRA. Thank you. Find out more at nmlra.org.